A guy eventually sits in the sixth seat. This guy was great. He was only there like an hour and a half. Now he wasn't annoying, but he talked, his volume was a little louder than average, and he like never stopped. So I could see how some people might be agitated, especially the like 60 year old woman in the five seat who was right next to him didn't seem to love it. I was having a great time. He sits down, he instantly asks like me in the eight seat together, um, what casinos don't have locals? So he asked a lot of questions about all this, like instantly, like no hello. Like he's just asking questions about casinos, how to get there. And even though we explained it, he didn't really seem to understand. He thought South Point and Golden Nugget were very close to each other. Not at all. Um, he asked us a lot of questions about the layout of Vegas. Then just like, as if like you're done reading the chapter of a book and you turn the page, he instantly, starts talking to the four seat. I don't know why exactly the four. He starts talking to the four seat about buffets. He says, is the buffet here any good? The one seat chimes in and says, no, you're definitely gonna get food poisoning. But he's mostly talking to the four seat about buffets. The best part of this buffet conversation was when he asked the four seat, which is better, the Luxor buffet or the Excalibur buffet? Because I'm staying at Luxor and I notice the Luxor buffet and the Excalibur buffet are both two dollars more than the MGM buffet. So I figure if it's more, it must be better. Excalibur and Luxor are both better than MGM. I'm willing to pay an extra two dollars, of course, to eat at the better buffet, but between Excalibur and Luxor, which one is better? No clue why all of a sudden he's asking the four seat this. The four seat hadn't said anything since the six seat sat to indicate he's an expert on buffets or restaurants in Vegas, but he's asking the four seat. He asks the four seat, and the four seat like thinks, he puts some thought into this and says, the Luxor Buffet. And then no one says anything for about three seconds. And then the four seat says, I've never been to either, but I would say the Luxor Buffet. And I say, so what are you basing it on? <laughs> if you've never eaten at either of them, never got an answer to that question. The highlight of the six seat stay at our table was probably when he asked the waitress for bourbon. So he asked, you know, are there alcoholic drinks around here? Yes. Um, eventually the waitress comes, and like as the waitress is getting close, he says to me, you know, I'm gonna get a shot of uh, Woodford. There's no chance, I don't even know alcohols, I know there's no chance he's getting Woodford. It sounds too expensive, I never hear anyone order it, he's not getting it. I tell him, well you're not getting Woodford, but you could get whatever liquor this is. It's gonna be another brand. He asks the waitress for Woodford and says the word Woodford at least five times during this request. Yeah, I'd like a shot of Woodford. Woodford bourbon, it's a bourbon. It's called Woodford. Do you have any Woodford? This went on for a really long time. Eventually the waitress said like, I don't think so, but if there is, I'll get it. Then he says like as she's walking away, any bourbon you have if you don't have Woodford. He said Woodford so many times. The waitress comes back and it was kind of hard to hear. Her voice was a little deep and it was a little noisy. She hands him bourbon and says what it is and I couldn't quite make it out. So after she leaves, because she was a lot closer to the sixth seat when she handed him the bourbon, I say, what bourbon did she say this is? And he goes, you know, I couldn't really hear that good. Um, I think she said Air Force. <laughs> There's no chance the answer is Air Force. <laughs> so anyway, he didn't come close to getting Woodford, which is funny because like three hours later, a guy sits in the sixth seat and says, uh, yeah, I'm gonna order a shot. Uh, I wonder if they have Woodford. I couldn't believe it. The guy from Minnesota on my right was still there. He couldn't believe it. Like, this guy was just pranking us. We call him Rage Text. Though, so never saw him before the uh, MGM promotion. So, this guy, Rage Text, it wasn't his name yet. But the three of us are at a table. He's sitting right next to Herbs and Rye. I wasn't. I was across the table from them. He's like, never looking up. He rarely knows when it's his, his turn. He always looks mad and Herbs and Rye can hear what he's talking, what he's saying into his phone. He's using voice to text to like send messages or leave notes and Herbs and Rye is telling me, he's texting me at the table what this guy is saying and it's some like really like mad, like violent things that he's like texting. It sounds like some woman that he's like really mad at. Um, it was odd, he was enraged the entire time. He's mad when he wins a hand, he's mad when he loses a hand, seriously the like, the tilt rants that Phil Hellmuth has done for everyone on TV and YouTube, like this guy puts Hellmuth to shame how mad he gets. It's ridiculous. 
but it's also very entertaining. So after Herbs and Rye was telling me all this that day, back in like late February, we started calling him Rage Text. He also claimed the dog that he brought into the casino was a service dog. It definitely wasn't. It wasn't trained. It would run off. He would see it run off into the casino floor. He wouldn't care. He wouldn't go after it for a while. And I heard him ask out a woman. It was very close to me. I heard him ask out a woman and bring up the dog as if it was gonna help his chances. So, I knew he's been in the room this week. Finally, tonight, he was at my table. I opened the table, I opened table 12, uh, pretty shortly after it opened. He sat down. <laughs> so, I was in the six, he was in the, um, I was in the seven, he was in the four. So like the long part of the table is between us. I can't like see everything that's going on over there, but I know it's him and he's doing some weird things. I saw him eating a sandwich very early and then like uh, later I saw a box of cherries he had on the table. Okay, so he gets up because he's losing a ton of hands and he's in so much rage that he has to like run off and try to calm down or whatever he does when he goes into a rage. So I asked the three seat who's sitting right next to him like, was, was he eating a sandwich when he first got here? Because that's what it kind of looked like from over here. And he goes, well, not just eating it, he was offering us sandwiches. And I said, like, he just has, like, tons of sandwiches made, and he was, like, handing them out. He goes, no, he's making them in his chair. He has a loaf of bread, he has a squeezed bottle of mayo, and he has a container of turkey. And he just sat down and started making sandwiches, and he started offering all of his sandwich fixings to everybody on the side of the table. Also, he's eating cherries, which of course, like, he can't just eat like, um, like pre-cut cantaloupe. You eat it and that's the end of it or something. Of course, he's eating something with uh, stems and pits. <sighs> so he's even weirder than usual, but he's also enraged the entire time. He's like looking at his phone and typing things and just being mad the entire time. But he's losing hands, which is great. It's really entertaining for us. And when he gets up, I'm like asking the three seed who's right next to him and understanding how ridiculous this guy is, what's going on. All right, so he gets into a hand with the three. We got really short. A lot of people were kind of like leaving their chips on the table, but leaving because this is Vegas and that's what they do. Um, so we were short for a while. Rage text at one point says, well, if we're this short, I'm just gonna raise every hand. All right, well, you're only doing that if you happen to pick up a hand, like right after you say it, and it's good timing. So he gets into a big hand with the three seed. The three seed raises, rage text, re-raises pre-flop um, call. The flop is jack high and they get all in. The three seat, solid, pleasant guy, has king jack, top hair. Rage text has queens. <laughs> so this plan worked of him pretending like he was gonna turn into a maniac and uh, he just picked up queens. King on the turn, perfect. Absolutely perfect. Um, the fireworks went off. Uh, so the three seat hit two pair, one. Rage text throws his cards, cause he's a jerk and takes out his phone. See, and now the thing is, when I used to keep my hand histories, I would write down the actions and like some thoughts I had in the hand. I would write down like, raise, 15, king jack, flop, queen three two, check, I see bet, $25. Like it would be the action so that later when I went home, I could remember it and put down, you know, step by step what happened in the hand. And then once I did that, I would re remember my thoughts and why I did everything I did. He takes out his phone to, voice to text, not even type, so we could hear it, voice to text, this rage hand history, it's just him being mad, it's nothing constructive about the hand. He just takes out his phone and he says like, oh, I set this guy up perfectly, I said I was gonna raise every hand, even though I wasn't gonna, and he came in raising, I three bet, I just threw in a handful of chips, I didn't even know how much it was, so he would think I'm just a maniac raising everything, and he gets all in with top hair, I have him with an over pair, and they just give him the turn, they just give him the, the king on the turn for two pair, and I lose, I can't believe it. Absolutely nothing constructive, just him being mad so that later he could go home and be extra mad about it. That was great. So right around that time, we got a new nine seat, this uh, guy from Austria, and he saw this, and Rage Text had to get up and leave and go calm down or get extra mad, whatever he does when he leaves the table. So I just started laughing. I was like holding my laughter in as best I could until he left. Started laughing, the three seed knew why. The nine seed, even though he just got to the table, kind of knew why. And he said, oh, what, is that guy mad again? <laughs> he just got to the table. Um, so I kind of explained what happened, and I said, well, yeah, you were playing with him like recently, and he was doing that. I said, yeah, yesterday. 
he was doing this. He was just mad all day yesterday. Then the three seed says, yeah, I was playing with him like two days ago, and he was just mad the entire time. He's been mad for like three days straight. And then I said, oh no, he's been mad for like 50 years straight. I guess based on the stuff that he left on the rail, because he, you know, brings his life in like a backpack and like a plastic bag when he comes to the casino. Um, the new dealer who was pushing in knows who's sitting there based on the stuff that was left on the rail. So when the new dealer comes in to sit, he points at the four seat, Rage Text's seat, and he goes, oh, is that uh, Mr. Bundle of Joy? <laughs> so that was great. Um, things were amazing. They were so entertaining. When Rage Text is winning hands, it's so frustrating because he is just trash, pure trash. And for anything good to happen to him, I can't stand it. Oh, when he's losing, it's fabulous. So, um, eventually he comes back to the table and he gets into a hand with the eight seat who was new to poker and didn't speak much English. The eight seat played queen seven of clubs, flopped a flush draw, turned the flush. They got all in on the turn and uh, Rage Tex never showed. Uh, once the river hit, seed eight showed his flush. Rage Tex threw his cards again like he does every time he loses a hand and then he stormed off. That was amazing. He left. Uh, I played a really long session. So, uh, I don't know, like eight hours later or something, he actually came back and was at my table again. Um, not buying in for like the thousand that he usually does. Um, he bought it for like 180 or something and he quickly transferred. I was hoping for some more fireworks uh, the second time around, but oh, that first time around was fabulous. It was like everything you could hope for when you're playing with a guy whose nickname is Rage Text. Everything went wrong for him. It was amazing. Another character, C3. That's uh, the best nickname I have for him. It started as soon as he got to the table. He told us about a story that happened the night before at MGM. He said a guy shorted the pot, and when he pointed it out, the guy lost it and started arguing with him. He said a guy who we later figured out is a regular, a local regular, and uh, it actually took a ton of asking. Like, I had to ask this guy a lot of questions, try to figure out who was the dealer, try to figure out the other locals at the table so that we could ask other people who this guy is. I really wanted to find out who it was. Oh, we found out who it was, which I didn't care for this guy anyway, but he wasn't like a cheater. Um, apparently there was a bet of 50 and this local guy put out 40. And when seat three the night before says, yeah, that's ten dollars short and he claims the other guy snapped at him and said you're not even in the hand I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm betting. I know how much I put in there Well, if all of that is true, you know, you're cheating the pot. That's not good So I don't get how that's your argument anyway, that's what c3 started us off with that story. That was great later um, Stealth mode came to the table. You remember stealth mode great nickname So c3 is in c3 stealth mode is in c5 c3 is in a hand with c2 it's a fairly small pot on the river c3 bets c2 folds and pretend like these are cards c3 takes his cards up off the table shows his neighbor and throws them face down stealth mode very stealthily not being funny he really said this very quietly asked the dealer i want to see those cards the dealer turns them over c3 didn't hear stealth mode ask he just sees the dealer turn his cards over so c3 says well thanks a lot for flipping my cards over he doesn't know anyone asked. The dealer says, if a player asks, you know, it's show one, show all, I need to flip the cards over. So then uh, C3 says, all right, who asked? I didn't hear anyone ask. And the dealer points at stealth mode in C5. So then C2 didn't really know what was going on. So C2 asked C3, uh, wait, what's going on? And C3 goes, oh, not that it mattered. It was such a tiny pot, but like, uh, that guy asked to see my cards. I, I just, I just had to figure out who the dick at the table was. <laughs> that was great because there, there was absolutely no reason. First of all, stealth mode is doing nothing with this information. He's just playing his quads and better. So that was just the beginning. About two hands later, and I'll give C3 a ton of credit for planning this in advance. I doubt he thought of it on the spot. C3 is playing a big hand, and uh, I need to move over to, to show you some arm movements in a second. He's in a big hand. He bets the river pretty big, and everyone folds. As soon as everyone folds, stealth mode is two seats to his left. C3 takes his cards, reaches across the face of the four seat, and shows his cards. He puts them right inches in front of Stealth Mode's face so that he could see the cards before he tables them. 
<laughs> that was great. I was the one laughing the most. I was the one who understood what he did the quickest. I laughed first. I laughed the hardest. I laughed for the longest. That was amazing. Um, and one more great thing with C3. Um, there was a hand where he was like going to be third to act pre-flop. As the dealer is dealing the cards, he says all in. Oh, that's binding. It's action out of, verbal is binding, and it's action out of turn. And there are rules for action out of turn. So I say to him, because no one at the table is going to enforce it, but it was a friendly table, except for stealth mode. But I tell him, be careful with that, because like, I don't think anyone's going to enforce it, but you could be all in right now. And C3 says to me, no, I'm not all in. No, that, that, that doesn't matter. And I said, it could. I don't think anyone's gonna make you, but yeah, like you could be all in. If the right person wanted you to be all in, you'd be all in right now. Just, I'm like warning you for the future. Like probably don't do that again. So, um, he doesn't believe me. The one seat folds, or the nine seat folded, the one seat folded, the two seat folded, and now it's on seat three. And before he acts, the dealer says, yeah, you know, since action didn't change, there was no raise in front of you your verbal declaration out of turn is now binding. Like if anyone cared, you'd be all in right now. And he said, really? Like I didn't even have cards. He goes, well, I had dealt the first card. The hand was in progress and you declared all in. Like you could be, I don't think anyone minds, but yeah, you could be in the future. So he plays the hand, um, he wins. He tips $5 for like the misunderstanding. He didn't tip it to me. Like I'm the one who warned him first. <laughs> But he tips it to the dealer, and he goes, oh, uh, you know, so, sorry, I, I didn't know. I really didn't think I'd be all in. I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. Um, so, okay, that's fine. So I say to him, you know, it's, it's nice to know that you don't believe anything I say, but you'll believe the dealer if he says the exact same thing. And the 3C says, no, I believed you. I did. And I said, no, you didn't. The first thing you said was, no, I'm not all in. And the 3C goes, nah, I didn't believe you. Final character of the uh, MGM Rakeback Promotion miniseries, I guess this turned into. Uh, this guy is uh, Shreveport. So two nights ago I played with him. Uh, yesterday we were also at the same table all day. And today he showed up a little later. So the first night nothing amazing happened. Uh, the second night uh, there was another guy at the table who was wearing a Longhorns t-shirt. So he starts talking about Austin. This other guy, not Shreveport. Um, Shreveport, Shreveport says... Oh yeah, my daughter just moved to Austin. So the guy with the Longhorns t-shirt says something and like uh, Shreveport like immediately cuts him off and it says, well, well, don't ask me about Austin. Don't ask me about the layout of the city. Don't ask me what neighborhood she lives in. Uh, she moved too far away. I haven't visited her yet. Um, she moved really far away, haven't visited her, don't know anything. So, I mean, if you're gonna ask me about Austin, I'm just not gonna know. This is before we knew where he was from. I'm telling you already, his name is Shreveport. But, um, so when he talks like this, I think he's from like really far northwest or like really far into the northeast. And eventually we ask him where he lives and he says, Shreveport. And I said like, isn't that western Louisiana? Isn't that the next state over? That's like as close as you can be to Texas, isn't it? And he goes, oh, but it, it, it's another state. It's, I mean, that, that's a long drive. Like I used to live in Houston. Houston to Austin, not that bad. I moved to Shreveport, and then my daughter moved to Austin. Oh, that's too far. Oh, that, that's too far. I haven't visited her yet. And I go, the way you were talking, I thought you lived in like northern New Hampshire or something. He goes, oh no, Shreveport to Austin. No, that's that's just too far. She moved too far away. So nothing, nothing we, nothing we did. He said the first night made me think he was going to come out with something like that. But that was great. The second night also, the same night we found out where he was from, Shreveport, he was really hungry. He hadn't eaten all day. Um, he was at the table before I got there and I played like over a 10 hour session. Um, so he was getting hungry and it was funny, Tap, the sports bar right by um, the poker room, it was the one night ever that I know of that they were closed for a private event. So he's asking like where else could he eat and a lot of the places in MGM are not anywhere close to the poker room. So I tell him, you know, I'm getting hungry too. I'm thinking about going to Raising Cane's. I mean, it's, it's out of the casino, but it's like way closer than those uh, restaurants on the other side of MGM. So he said uh, he didn't want to eat fried food, which, all right, but he made it sound like it was a like, a, like a lifelong decision to not eat fried food. So I went to Cane's, brought it back. I, I asked him again if he wanted any. He said no, he said maybe tomorrow. So I brought back Cane's. He went to a Wolfgang Puck's restaurant and got a, uh, 
linguine and meatballs. So, all right, he ate something and we played for a while. Um, today, I was playing for a while. He came in fairly late and I had eaten at the buffet before I came in, so I wasn't planning on eating again. But he came in and we were at different tables this time, but he was at the table right next to me. So he walked by, he said hi. And then like after he played one hand, he came back to me and uh, he said, if you're making that Canes run today, I'm in. Cause I guess yesterday, yeah, one of us said, I guess I said like, all right, if you're here tomorrow, maybe Canes tomorrow or something. Um, but now that it actually was tomorrow, today, the night that I'm filming, uh, I ate at the buffet and I didn't need to eat again, but now I can't, uh, I can't let Shreveport down. So, um, he said he wanted canes. So I waited till uh, my table had a pretty slow dealer so I wouldn't miss that many hands. Uh, I told him I was going and uh, he gave me some money. I went to canes. I, it would be weird to go there and only get food for him. So I got food for him. I got food for me, brought it back. Uh, I didn't time it today, but canes is very close and they're very quick in there. Uh, yesterday, when I went for just me, I looked at the time when I left the table. I looked at the time when I came back so I could see how many minutes I missed when I'm recording my hours. I was gone 11 minutes. I left the table. I walked through MGM. I got to the sidewalk, walked to Canes, ordered, waited, got the food, came back. All of that only took 11 minutes. Canes is very close to the MGM poker room. Uh, so I didn't time it this time. I had to wait a little longer. It was a little more crowded in there. Also had two orders, two combos to bring back, but uh, still very quick. Uh, gave Shreveport his, uh, his change and his, uh, his uh, four piece box combo, I guess they call it. And uh, that was it. Would have been cool to play all three nights with Shreveport, but uh, that was funny. The funny, funniest thing he said was genuinely thinking, genuinely telling us his thoughts about how far Shreveport is from Austin, even though I would not agree, and then uh, kind of forcing me into <laughs> eating canes uh, tonight. But it was a lot of fun, and uh, I think he's in town for one or two more days. Might see him again.